Hi, everyone. My name is Marta. Um, as uh, uh, Francesca just said, I worked at DeepMind for over seven and a half years. Uh, and during that time, actually, a lot of my research was focused on generative modeling, which is why I'm very excited that I got the generative model lecture. Woo! Um, if I think about the time when I started uh, at DeepMind, I actually started with generative modeling. And back in the day, people, the general public, knew about machine learning. They had heard about AI. They were starting to learn. But no one would be able to know what generative modeling is. This was not a thing in the outside world. This has changed. Uh, nowadays, uh, everyone and their mothers knows about generative AI. I have taken some random screenshots uh, of across the internet and headlines. It applies to finance, legal people are talking about it, the heads of companies, everyone cares about generative AI. Um, so needless to say, this is a very important topic. Um, and it's not only an important topic in the real world. If we look at our schedule this week, um, I have boxed in green, a lot of lectures that are related, directly related to generative modeling from the title only. Um, so clearly, this is an important topic you're going to be discussing this week as well. So um, I don't think I need to further motivate it. With regards to this talk, um, I'd like people to understand what I'm talking about. So if you're confused about something, please ask. This can be as interactive as we want to have it. Um, I like, I'm going to talk relatively high level about the space. My idea is to give you an idea of what the space of generative modeling looks like, how people think about it when they're trying to design new models. Um, I'm not going to talk necessarily about state of the art. I think you'll have a lot of those in some of these other uh, lessons. But I'd like to give you the fundamentals of generative modeling. So the question number one with that would be, what is a generative model? Um, so a generative model, very basically, is a machine learning model that tries to learn the probability px of our data, the probability distribution. Um, so normally, this is displayed as this green blob that is some data distribution in some space. Um, and individual points from that distribution would be the individual, the probability for the different samples. So for example, for MNIST, uh, that blob would show you the probability of sampling the different uh, images. And if you took a sample from one in that space, it could be a six, it could be a one. Um, and this is the probability distribution you want to learn. Now, you might ask, why would we want to learn this probability distribution over our data, P of x? Um, well, it's actually really useful. Uh, the main one that the model itself kind of hints at, uh, if you know the probability of your data, you can sample from that, and then you can generate new uh, samples that look a lot like your data. This is what ChatGPT is doing. It samples new sentences. You, I'm sure you've seen a lot of generative models that generate images, and they will look similar to the data, but not exactly the same, and so on. Um, there's also an argument to be, to be made uh, around, for some of the generative models, you can try to determine how likely is a sample given your distribution, right? So this could be useful, for example, if you want to do outlier detection. Um, and finally, a point that not a lot of people talk about. I'm sure some of you have heard about the distinctions between discriminative models and generative models, discriminative being those that are usually classifiers uh, and, and that don't learn the underlying model distribution. Um, generative models are a superset of discriminative models. If you know the distribution, P of x, you can do whatever you could have done with a discriminative model. You can use it for classification. You can use it for anything else, right? So you ha if you have the ability to learn P of x and learn a generative model, that's a big if, you'd, you'd be better off learning the generative than the discriminative if you can. Of course, this all sounds too good to be true, so there must be some bad news, and these are them. Um, learning the data distribution is actually incredibly difficult. And that's the main of this talk, is to talk about how people have overcome this difficulty of learning this very complex data distribution. When I showed you the blob earlier, as you can see there, it makes it, it I, I actually think that this is a bit of a weird representation, because it makes it seem as though it would be relatively easy to learn some like blobby looking distribution. I think the distribution is more likely going to be something like the right, right? If we took three random pixels of an image and we put the maxes and then we put the probability, joint probability of these pixels lighting up together, it wouldn't look so much like a blob, but rather like something like this, right? And now imagine you don't have three pixels, you have 784 for MNIST alone, right? So you have a 784 dimensional space with some very sparse blobs here and there that are the cover of the distribution. And this is what you now have to model. Like this is an extremely difficult problem. And for me, nothing makes it more clear than numbers. Um, let's take a very simple example, and I'll show you just how impossible and hopeless this is. Um, let's take MNIST. 
Okay, and let's simplify it even further and say the pixels can be black or white. It's a binary MS. Um, if we wanted to approximate, approximate this distribution, we would need to see loads of samples, right? Per pixel, if we assume Bernoulli because it's binary, we would need in the order of 100 samples. This is a random number, but you need more or less 100 samples to approximate a Bernoulli distribution. This is one pixel. If you have two pixels, the joint is going to be 100 to the power of 2. Now we have 784 pixels, right? That's 100 to the power of 7, uh, uh, 784, which is 10 to the power of 1,500. This is how many samples we would need to be comfortable with whatever approximation we have created. MNIST, the data set itself, is actually 70,000 samples. Uh, you can see the difference between 10 to the less than 10 to the power 5 and 10 to the power 1,500 that we're desperately far away to have the data that we would need uh, to cover, to actually be able to estimate this distribution, right? And I have to emphasize, MNIST is considered an archaic and very small data set, and we assumed it was binary, right? This case gets much worse. And as you grow your data set with every dimension, this gets worse and worse and worse, right? So this is a huge problem. So we can't just go about and model P of X as of where from samples and data. There's no hope for that, right? So we're going to have to start making assumptions about our data. We're going to have to make simplifications such that hopefully with data sets as big as 10 to the power of 5, we get anywhere near sampling. And the fact that we know that we can sample from MNIST shows you that there are ways and it's not all hopeless. As I mentioned, in this lecture, we're going to cover different types of models and how they have uh, addressed this, how, what assumptions they're making in order to be able to model P of X. Um, I'm going to talk about five main classes. Uh, we're going to go through autoregressive models, normalizing flow, latent variable models, diffusion models, I'll tie on, touch on lightly because there, you will have a full lecture following this one. And finally, a short nod to GANs. Are we all on board and excited for generative modeling? Okay, it's 9 a.m., but uh, eventually, hopefully. <laughs> Great, okay, autoregressive models, it's the simplest modeling and very related, well, related to transformers, which if, I, if I'm correct, you should have heard about yesterday. So this is a concept that we're all more or less on board with. I'll cover it nonetheless. Autoregressive models don't make any restrictions as to what distribution you're using. So it could be Gaussian, it could be not, no, it doesn't care. The only restriction it puts is it says, okay, if I take the dimensions of my data uh, we're, and I'm gonna order them, and that's the crucial part, I'm going to assume that the, earlier di that the later dimensions are conditionally dependent on the earlier dimensions. And this is shown in this little diagram. So you would sample your first dimension of your data point, and then the second would depend on the first, the third on the two previous ones, and so on. The joint distribution, this is a bit squashed. The joint distribution can therefore be written by, as this product of over all the conditionals for every pixel. Um, the motivation for doing for modeling the joint like this is that you hope that modeling the conditional distribution is easier than modeling the full joint between all of the dimensions. Um, it's often parallelizable, as you have learned yesterday in the case of transformers. You can parallelize training, which is great. Um, and usually it, it helps you with memory as well, right? Not having to have this whole full joint in memory uh, it can be beneficial for memory as well. To make it a bit more clear for images, in case anyone is still <laughs> not on board with this, the way one would sample for images, for example, is you would pick the first pixel and then sample the second based on that, and you would go basically row by row like this. This is how Pixel CNN back in the days used to generate images. In terms of how you model the conditionals, nowadays what is normally used is a neural network to approximate this conditional distribution. As you would have learned yesterday, a transformer is nowadays the choice uh, for modeling P of X given the, this conditional to a distribution of P of X. Um, and again, it looks the same. You have an input, you put it into your model, so for example, transformer. The output is then passed jointly with the previous input into the next neural network and so on. And it's very easy to just back propagate through that. So the model is relatively simple um, and as defined per the previous slide. Now, how do we train it? Because there's always a model definition and then model training. Those are the two main uh, problems of generative modeling. And essentially, when we are, what we're trying to do here, as I mentioned, is match our estimated distribution as closely as possible to the data distribution, right? So we would like um, 
the, well, we would like the likelihood. This is our approximated distribution. We would like the, data, the likelihood of a sample from the data to be very high. Uh, and of course, we want to add that up over the entire data set. This uh, type of loss is called maximum likelihood. Um, and when we use it for training, it's maximum likelihood estimation. It's a very straightforward loss. We can evaluate our, uh, our P of uh, X because our model has an explicit form of that P of X. So it's easy to evaluate, straightforward to understand. We just average over the data. Everyone's happy. Maximum likelihood and autoregressive models are very simple. Out of all of these models that I'm going to talk about, they are the simplest. Um, but they work well, and if it works well and it's simple, it is an explanation of why transformers are also so popular, right? We don't have to do a lot of constraints, a lot of fiddly, they just work. I wanted to, do, uh, to have a little side comment around the relationship with, uh, between maximum likelihood and KL divergence, because KL will also play a big role in a lot of the, the generative models going forward. Uh, and it's interesting to know this relation between those two. Uh, the KL divergence is a statistical difference uh, between two distributions. So if you want to compare how similar are your distributions, say P of X and Q of X, you would use the KL divergence. Um, the KL divergence is, well, defined as you can hear, as the expectation of the log ratio between the distribution that you're trying to compare with the other. Um, it is crucially not symmetric, and that's why it's not called, it's not a metric officially, right? So the KL between P and Q is not going to be the same as the KL between Q and P. There's ways around that. People don't, it's, it still works as that is. Um, and importantly also for later on, the KL is non-negative, and it only is zero if these distributions perfectly match. This will come in later as well. Um, so what's interesting is that this KL divergence it also can also be as a used as a description of what MLE, so maximum likelihood estimation, is doing. If we think about our problem as minimizing the KL between our data and our estimated distribution, and I'm going to apologize in advance, I use D and P of X as the data distribution interchangeably in this series, so sometimes it's one, sometimes the other. You'll have to bear with me. So if we take the KL divergence between the actual data distribution and our own distribution, we can rewrite that. Um, by just writing out what the KL actually means. We then take the log out and to do a difference, and then we can see that this one doesn't really depend on what we're trying to minimize, which is that theta, which basically means we're just trying to minimize the negative log probability, which is the same as maximizing the log probability. So we recover MLE, right? So there's a very direct uh, correlation between MLE and uh, KL divergence, which I think is interesting, and we've also introduced the KL divergence. Examples of autoregressive models, um, there's many. Um, I've, I'm mentioning here Pixel CNN because I think nowadays when people think about autoregressive, everyone's mind goes, of course, to uh, language models like ChatGPT. Um, but they've been around for a long time. And uh, back in the day, they were even used for image, um, for image generation. So Pixel CNN was another model that would just generate images as a sequence and then conditional on the previous, on the previous models as well. I'm going to start making a little table where I go through all the models um, and actually mention more the drawbacks really than the positives. The positives have been mentioned throughout the whole talk. Um, autoregressive modelers, um, they have one of the drawbacks, which I'm sure you also discussed in transformers. When it comes to sampling, we cannot sample the whole dimensions at, one, at once, obviously. The definition is that you have to go one after the other, which can sometimes make them slow. So that's one of the pain points really of transformers. Um, they can, however, give you the log likelihood, so we have uh, an exact version of the log likelihood, and we can uh, evaluate it, so we can use it for out of distribution detection. Um, and I'd say one of the drawbacks is that the dimensions need to be actually sortable, right? So in cases like language, this makes a lot of sense, because language has an order. It makes sense that one word comes before the other. That's how language works. In an image, you could argue that that makes less sense, right? Why is this pixel need to be before this other in the corner? So I think it is, it makes more sense in some than others. Arguably also why they're maybe not as used, not used as much in images as, for example, diffusion models, um, but yes, on language. Are we all happy with autoregression? Are we happy? <laughs> okay. Great. The next class of models is called normalizing flows. 
as before, we're going to have this very complex looking function that, or data distribution that we want to be able to sample from or model, our P of X. Um, if you look at it, it looks kind of complex. And if we would ideally like to deal with something that's much simpler, best case a Gaussian, right? We know how to deal with a Gaussian. So how can we turn this into a Gaussian is a bit the motivation for this. And the insight on normalizing flows is that there are certain transformations F, and we'll get to what certain means in a bit, that if you apply them to a PDF, you will get another PDF with the, with, well, you will get the uh, uh, distribution with the following uh, properties. One, it will also be a PDF. Two, it will no longer be a Gaussian. So if we apply it to a Gaussian, it'll now look a little bit more interesting. Um, and three, we can still backpropagate through this. So if we have a loss, we can use this still to pass our gradients, which is very useful in deep learning. More specifically, not only can we do that, but we can also express the, neck, the distribution that we have, the new distribution that comes out of the transformation uh, in closed form. So here we have the new distribution, that's what that dash is, is gonna be our old distribution. And then this here, without going into too much depth, is a normalizing factor. That's also what's called normalizing flows. Um, and basically it's just ensuring that our new distribution is still a PDF. Um, some of the assumptions we're making here, as I mentioned, we have Z, which is the original distribution. Uh, Z is a variable sample from P of Z. Uh, and then X is going to be transformed by our function F. And more importantly, F needs to be invertible. So this is something that will carry throughout the talk, which means that here, wherever we have Z, we can also just insert F. This will be important later. For now, it's just some arbitrary sub, uh, change that we have made. Okay, so what have we done? We have taken a probability distribution, we have applied some F, and we now can actually express our new probability distribution in terms of this previous one. The idea behind normalizing flows is like, okay, this worked, why don't we do it again? And again and again and again for a lot of times until hopefully our function is so far away from a Gaussian and so complex that it is the PDF that we want, right? So how can we make our distribution from something really simple turn it into something really complex or for lots of steps of applying a transformation. Of course, we're gonna have to understand how to calculate that new uh, probability distribution. This looks complicated, but we're, bear with me. All we're trying to say is, can we express the next step as a function of things we know, okay? So this is the equation that we had earlier on the slide. This is how you know the next step. Um, we can replace this in inverse of zi with the previous step. This is just because it's an invertible function. Um, so that's fine. And then in here, uh, as a result of the inverse function theorem, we can replace this part of the normalization. We can, so, so is there a pointer? There's no pointer. Um, ah, and it's visible. It's a good morning so exercise as well. Here. Aha, okay, great. Perfect. No, you can see the. Yeah, the lasery one. Yeah. Off we go, even cooler. Great, thank you. Um, great. So what we're trying to do is change this normalizing factor into something that is a function of things we know. We do not know what this inverse is. We do know what this. We do not know what the next zi is. Right. We only know the previous step, and we know the forward function. With the inverse function theorem, we can rewrite this as this inverse. So already, okay, we're now depending no longer on the inverse itself, but we, we do know f, so that's a good first step. Um, and then we can take out the inverse um, out of the determinant. What this leaves us with, these are just a, a, a few steps that seem somewhat arbitrary, but with the, what this leaves us with is, we can describe the probability distribution as the next step, that's this one, using the probability distribution at the previous step, and some normalization that just depends on the transformation, which is a known variable to us, it, um, the, uh, the derivative of that function with respect to a variable that we know. So these are all things we know, which is great. So this was one step. How do we express it over all of these steps? And this is actually quite simple because all we do is unroll, right? This is the, whoop, this is the function that we had for one step, but now we can express this again, recursively, 
as uh, the composition of the previous, uh, the previous uh, distribution and a normalization. And then we unpack this as the previous and normalization and so on, right? And we end up with a long list of normalizations. So we add up over all the normalizations across the whole flow and the initial distribution. This is ideal, right? The initial distribution is a Gaussian as we have established. So that's just a normal Gaussian and then a bunch of normalizations that are gonna transform this Gaussian into a very complex function. I'm aware that there was a lot of equations going on. Are we more or less on board with this? Great. Great, okay, so the learnable parameter, you might ask where, what am I learning here? There are learnable parameters in the function f, right? And we'll, I'll say a little bit more about this in a concrete example in a minute, but trust me, there are learnable parameters in there. Um, so because we effectively, we have direct access to p of x, we can plug in whatever our data sample is into a Gaussian and then just normalize it with all of these normalizing factors. So we have an explicit uh, definition of our likelihood. Uh, we can actually use MLE for training, which is great. This makes our life very easy. So training in this part is not, not a headache. Um, now, the more complicated part. As I mentioned to you earlier, not all the functions f uh, allow us to do this. For normalizing flows, there are certain characteristics that this function f has to have. Number one, it needs to be invertible, and I mentioned this earlier, so this is crucial for us to be able to do all that shifting around of equations that we did. And number two, uh, the Jacobian determinant, which was this like uh, normalizing factor, needs to be able to be computed, and also efficiently, ideally, because you have to do loads of them, right? So you don't wanna have a model where it takes you ages to compute that determinant. An example is, and probably one of the most famous uh, normalizing flows, is the real MVP. Um, and basically, what it does, it defines this function f of x in the following way. You take uh, your sample, uh, which has d, dist uh, d dimensions, and the first small d dimensions are gonna, for the next step, are gonna remain the same. So that mapping f is not gonna touch the first half. And then the second half is gonna be this function. So you take the previous x and then apply an exponential and an s and t, and the, it doesn't really matter what exactly we're doing there, but you basically update the second half. And then what you're gonna do is in the next step, you actually do it the other way around. You update the top half and leave the, the bottom half intact and so on and so on. And so you keep applying, this is basically their F function. Um, you see here the letters S and T. Mm -hmm. These are the learnable parameters. They're usually implemented as neural networks, right? So you're just having a neural network that takes in the previous uh, dimensions, process them in some way or another, it's not super relevant, and then produces the new dimensions of the other one. Um, and what the reason this is a bit weird and like half of them are not touched and half of them are touched and so on is because they wanted them to satisfy these constraints. Uh, as we mentioned, there's two. First, be invertible. Um, it's easy to show that they are. I mean, the first line is trivial. And then the second line, it's all computations that can be inverted. So we're fine on that front. Um, and then second, is the determinant easy to, compo uh, to, um, to compute? Uh, and it is because the Jacobian, because we have this like, not being touched versus being touched uh, part of the dimensions. The Jacobian is actually lower triangular, so if you take the determinant of that, it's just the product of the diagonal, right? Which is very easy. We know how to compute that very quickly. So that made life very easy, and it explains why they have this breakup into half and half. This work is relatively old, so these images don't look as nice as we're used to anymore in 2024. Um, but back in the day, this was uh, quite exciting, and I think it is, an interesting way to model distributions and to have access to others that maybe are not as trivial or that we cannot just assume, for example, autoregressivity onto. Um, we can sample dimensions in parallel, that's great, so faster than autoregressive models. We do have the log likelihood and we have it explicitly um, and exactly, which is great. Um, some of the drawbacks are that in general, the number of steps K that you had to do in order to get from a Gaussian to something that is not completely uh, irrelevant is quite long, uh, and that also made them hard to learn. Um, and also the fact that they, because you are maintaining the same dimensionality throughout, the, di the models were very large, right? It's not like autoencoders where you could actually reduce the dimensionality and then work in some latent space and then go back up. Here you have to remain in input space, which makes them huge models to work with. Great, and that was... Um, normalizing flows. Questions? You're either all asleep 
or I'm a really good explainer and I'm not sure. <laughs> I think the, the way they came up was less from a geometric and rather from this, this notion of we need something that we can back propagate through uh, and, we, and we need to be able to invert it, right? And then I think with those, it, it narrows down the scope, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's a great question. If I think, I mean, I'm sure in the limit of if you have infinite steps of la 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 and you have a function approximator, I'm not even sure, to be honest. No, I don't know if there's a theoretical guarantee. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Unclear how we, a lot of these is quite random, the motivation. I mean, once we get to GANs as well, it's a bit arbitrary. And I think, yeah, I'm not sure about normalizing flows exactly where, no. But yeah, worth asking. <laughs> Nowadays, a bit less so, I'd say. Back in the day, it w let's put it this way, less in like the image text space, less in the real world. And sometimes when you have to go from one distribution to another in like science or data distributions that are uh, less complex, I find. But in general, they're being used much less uh, right now. It is a good tool to have because it's interesting to understand how you can go from one to the other. And sometimes they're used in combination with other models, right? So they're good models that can be used for video and whatnot, where you can see there's an aspect of normalizing flows, but they've then beefed them up with a million other models. Um, so it's good to understand that part. But by themselves, no. <laughs> Not so much, yeah. Why we're using what? <laughs> ah, sorry. Yes, great. No, I was asking uh, whether there is a reason why we're use, we're using a, a forward map rather than uh, something like a, a transport plan uh, that is uh, a kernel over the, the whole distribution. <laughs> I mean, in theory, if you, I think that the, these, for example, the real MVP was something that worked in practice. If that makes sense. So I think this was a very practical approach. Like this will be easy to compute. This will fall down to just the product of the this, and this will make our life easier. It might work in theory with kernels. I don't know if it'll be like practically faster, right? I think this is one of those where it might make the computation so huge that it might not. The fact that people have not done it so much makes me think that maybe it is computationally quite heavy, uh, or maybe that people are scared of kernels, which I think both apply. Uh, so yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, great, latent variable models. Um, so far, the two models we've looked at were sampling in the data space. Uh, so in the first one, you were sampling one, one pixel at a time, which is very clearly already in data space. Uh, for the normalizing flow, even though we're technically sampling some latent T space, we're still only applying these like transformations. That, uh, uh, that, so it's still basically your data space. Latent variable models work a bit differently. They assume you have a latent variable that your data can condition on, and that latent variable is stochastic. So we can see it here. You can imagine for your data at a conceptual high level, imagine you have a data set of images, of, and then this could be like you sample and you get dog, if it's a categorical one, and then you generate images of dog. So you, it, it never works as cleanly as this, but the assumption is that you have this conditional dependence on a latent variable that captures some information about your model. Often, this latent variable is also much lower dimension on the data, because if there's some structure in the data, you're hoping that that can be uh, uh, distilled out of the data. There are some benefits to having this latent space. Um, as I mentioned, this latent variable Z can be lower dimensional, and it usually is. There is this bottleneck. Uh, 
Um, so you are working in a, a smaller dimensional space than if you're in outer space, that's great. Uh, and second of all, it, synch it, it, it is a different way of synchronizing the different dimensions, right? When we were thinking about autoregressive models, part of the reason we're doing this conditional dependence is because we want them all to be synchronized in some way, right? If we just sample them all at the same time independently, we would just have random noise across all the pixels, right? So this is why we say, okay, first, then this depending on that, this depending on that, so they're all kind of synchronized. If you have one latent variable that you condition all of the pixels on, that also allows you to have them all be related in a different way. Um, however, these benefits come at a cost, as always. Um, if we were to calculate P of X, which is what we're interested in since the beginning, we're gonna have to get the marginal distribution uh, over the latent space. What does this mean? We know that uh, P of X relates uh, to Z in that con via this conditional. So if we wanted to get, this gives us the joint, and if we wanted to have just X by itself, we need to marginalize out by just integrating out all of the Zs. Now the Zs are uh, in an unknown latent space that we cannot really uh, integrate through to begin with, but also it's completely intractable. So, what this means is that we are not able to just train with a normal maximum likelihood, as I mentioned earlier, because we don't have access to P of X. Does that make sense? Great. So what people did instead, and there, this is where variational uh, models came about, is they took an, a Bayesian uh, approach to it. We can express P of X not only by marginalizing out over the latent space, but uh, we can express it also via its conditional, and we can say, okay, it equals our joint over the conditional of this z over x. Now, this p of z given x is referred to as the posterior. So these are the three terms if anyone has done Bayesian learning. Um, if we have a latent variable, we have a prior. We think, like, what is the prior over my distribution? For x, the conditional on z is gonna be called the likelihood, and then the reverse conditional of that is the posterior. And it basically, this, what it, this is saying is, what is my prior over this latent variable? Given that I have a latent variable, what is my probability distribution over my output? And this just means, if I have seen my output, what is the posterior probability of having this latent variable, if that makes sense? So, okay. We now need to find a way of optimizing or finding an objective that we can optimize in order to train a model that has this latent variable. If we remind ourselves, ultimately what we care about is this expectation to maximize the expectation of the data under our model. This is always at the back of our heads what we want to optimize. The question is, can we shift things around, and there'll be a lot of shifting, such that we can phrase this objective, uh, but maybe as a function of this new term that I showed you, where we have the join over the conditional. And the answer is yes. Um, so let's go through it together. And this is how we're gonna derive the elbow. Um, as I mentioned earlier, P of X can be described, actually, we forgot we had a pointer. Uh, can be described in this way. Uh, we can then take the log of it, which makes it uh, a bit more bearable. So this is gonna be negative log of this plus positive log of this, as we have here. This is the trick now. We can add and remove Q of Z given X. Q of Z given X is our estimated posterior. It is the same as P of X given, uh, Z given X, but it is usually signaled with a Q to ensure that we understand that this is the variational posterior. We can add and remove this because uh, this doesn't change anything. Like we can do this 100 times if we wanted to. But this helps us is that if we now use this to restructure, it gives us a bit clarity about what this function can look like. So we've added and removed this, and then we can join up these two terms uh, and join up these two terms, and we can take the expectation. This is another thing. We can take expectations on both sides. This ultimately is what we cared about. If you remember, we want the expectation of, our data, of the data given our model to be high, so this is what we're interested in. And then these are two terms. Let's look at those two terms a bit more specifically. As I mentioned, this is what we want to maximize. This, if you remember from me earlier, is actually a KL distribution. So it is saying what is the difference between this Q and this P. Um, we're not gonna, it's not important beyond this actually, beyond the fact that because it's a KL, we know it's not negative, right? So we know that this term in the middle here needs to be zero or more. It's never gonna be negative. Which means that this term here is always gonna be smaller or equal to this. Right? So this is great, because this here looks much more like something we can optimize, and we'll continue breaking that down a bit. 
And actually, it is related to this. It is at least, uh, uh, it is uh, at best exactly our, what we're trying to optimize, or less, always. And this is what uh, invariational inference is called the evidence lower bound, which is exactly what I just said. We have, we know that our probability, uh, our probability uh, of our distribution, the data of, uh, the probability of our data given the distribution is going to be lower bounded by this expression on the left. Okay, that is something. What can we do with the lower bound? It's not the same as optimizing an objective, um, but it is the, the optimal parameters are the same for both. That's already pretty good. Um, and usually we can at least have some sort of guarantees that, that you can have from bounds, right? It's never gonna be as good, but it's better than nothing. Um, finally, we have the, this was, the, this was the, the two terms that were on the right of the lower bound. We would like, them to, ex we would like to express them in terms of this uh, prior posterior likelihood that I mentioned to you earlier, because those are the ones that we're playing around with, and we don't really know how to deal with this joint over here. So there's a very easy rewrite where we once again add some distribution and remove it, which we're allowed to do, um, which leaves us with here the KL between two distributions and here the, uh, the log of the uh, likelihood. Now, why is this interesting? And then basically, so I've just rewritten this in terms. So this is, this is the elbow that I find the most intuitive. There's many ways of deriving this. There's people that write the former slide as the elbow. They're all correct, right? We're just shifting terms around. It doesn't really matter. For me, this one is the most intuitive one. Why? Basically, what it's saying is our objective is lower bounded by the difference between the prior that we impose on the latent variable and actually the posterior that we observe of a latent variable, which acts as a regularizer, and we'll talk about it in a minute, and the likelihood of, given that we've sampled in space, in latent space, what is our, uh, what is our, the likelihood of our, our sample. Uh, so I think that as, an, as, a, as a, an objective, it is quite intuitive, which I like. Um, most of you have probably heard of variational autoencoders. There is there one way of implementing this, um, and the way they work is you would have uh, an input, then a neural network usually that is uh, uh, that uh, implements the encoder, and what it does is it takes a larger dimensional space into a much smaller dimensional space. Usually, that's why it's called the bottleneck, um, and what it outputs is the parameters over some distribution. In the case of VAEs, it's going to be the parameters of a Gaussian. So we get the mean and variance for a Gaussian that we can then sample from. And this mean uh, variance are going to be the mean and variance of our posterior. Usually we define a prior as well. In the easiest of cases, we just say it's a, it's a normal, it's a normal, uh, it's a, a zero, a variant, um, zero mean unit variance Gaussian. Um, and that we're going to use for the KL. And then finally, this Z that we've sampled, we can pass it through a decoder, which will be another neural network. Um, and that outputs, again, mu and sigma, which are going to parametrize our likelihood distribution. So we can say, okay, the data, given this distribution defined by mu and sigma here over here, how likely is an actual data point under that distribution? Um, this one here I mentioned serves as a regularization. You can see that as a regularization term. So normally, if the posterior was not bound by this, what often happens is that it could be shifting in space completely. This, however, if you say, okay, I want it to remain relatively close to a uh, normal Gaussian, it, it helps uh, the posterior distribution to not go a bit too crazy, if that makes sense. One of the... One of the things in addition that uh, the original VAE paper introduced and something that is worth thinking about as well, which is not very trivial with these latent variable models, is the fact that because you're sampling in latent space, backpropagation is not completely trivial. Um, I'm gonna actually show this one first. Uh, this is a computation graph. The squarey ones are deterministic variables. The round one is a stochastic variable. Um, if any of you are familiar with this, you will know that you cannot pass gradients through stochastic variable. So this is what our VAE would look like. We have X, we then sample Z, and then uh, we get uh, the function, the, the whole, uh, the, the function that describes the whole VAE. We cannot really pass gradients through it. However, what the reparameterization trick does is instead of describing 
sampling from Z as just sampling from a normal Gaussian like we would. We're going to write Z as a deterministic function of mu and sigma that is uh, scaled by some noise. So you're just rewriting. This effectively is actually doing the same thing, right? You're saying, take a mean, and we can do this because Gaussian properties, well, it's Gaussian and a few other distributions. Not all of them can do it. But in the case of Gaussian, you can just say, take the mean and add some noise with the scale of your variance, right? That is kind of the same as sampling from a Gaussian distribution. However, it now moves the stochasticity of the graph outside of your computation graph of the gradients, so you're able to actually backpropagate through it. VAEs uh, are not as use in use anymore as they used to be. Again, everything has been a bit wiped out by diffusion and transformers. Um, but this was probably some of the best that they have done. NVIDIA always manages to get very high risk faces, no matter what model. Um, one of the characteristic things I think of VAEs that you'll see often is that they blur it out. And like the images always look a bit like, like uh, diffused in a way. And uh, this has to do with the fact that, well, first of all, it's a lower bound, so the, 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 examples are, the samples are never going to be as good as if you had an actual true objective. Um, but secondly, um, because you have this prior where you're trying to pull everything to the mean and average out, you actually end up with these like soft images, which I think is quite typical of, of VAEs. Um, so to put them into our table, latent variable models, yes, we can sample in parallel. We can get the log likelihood as well. We can actually uh, evaluate it with, our, with the, the decoder. Um, however, some of the drawbacks are that this objective, this the elbow that we have, is a surrogate objective. It's not the true objective. And the results are often medium. Uh, and they're also a bit fiddly to play around with. So I think this is why people over time maybe have gone off a little bit. Um, oh, also, maybe just to mention this model over here, was actually a hierarchical model. So it's not just a vanilla VA. You've had to have a lot of bells and whistles uh, in order for them to work well. Great. OK, diffusion models. Um, a quick one, just to put them into the map. Mm. Um, OK, diffusion. This one has a very clear motivation. It was originally uh, motivated by physicists. Um, and this is, again, very related to this idea of we have a very complex function. I wish I could sample from a Gaussian. So this is a general theme. And then how do we go from one to the other once again? In this particular case, the idea is a bit different. You basically say, OK, if I have that very complex function, if I add a little bit of Gaussian noise, uh, the function will be a bit less weird looking, maybe. And if I do that for enough times, you can actually show that you converge on a Gaussian. Um, and I find, yeah, and I find this actually easier to see with images. And actually, the examples that the fusion papers often give are with images. If you start with an MNIST, all I've done here is just add some Gaussian noise iteratively. And you can see after a while, this looks indistinguishable from a Gaussian, right? And you might wonder, why do I care about this? Well, in this direction, yes, I've just added noise. But if I was able to learn the inverse mapping, so these question marks at the top, in an ideal world, later I can just sample from what is Gaussian noise and just turn that into samples by just reversing that. There's a lot of math on how to make this fast. Intuitively, this is a concept. Uh, you will hear lots about it in the next lecture, which is exclusively on diffusion models. So I don't want to step too much on their toes and take too much away. But I felt like it was important to place this in the map alongside with all the other models. Just adding them to the table as well, why not? You can parallel sample all of the, all the dimensions, which is great. You have, again, still the likelihood, because similar as with flows, you can still just backpropagate through all of these iterations. Um, the drawbacks, I mean, the fusion models are big, and there's a, part of, there's a reason why they have their own lecture here as well, right? They're being very useful in images, um, so they're great. They do have some drawbacks where this noise model that you um, that you keep adding is not necessarily always useful for all tasks. This is a bit related to when I said the autoencoders, it doesn't always make sense to order the order that I mentioned. It makes sense for language, not so much for images. Here it's a bit the other way around, right? If you just keep adding noise, it makes sense for images. It doesn't necessarily maybe make sense to add Gaussian noise to language, right? So it's a bit, uh, depending on what your task is, you might go to one versus the other. And finally, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which are a bit out of vogue at the moment, but I think nonetheless interesting to, to hear about. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, GANs are a bit different to all of the other ones, which I think is what, what makes them actually interesting. Um, and as opposed to the other ones, they're not going to explicitly model P of X and think about how can I structure it such that I, if I break it down, I still have an exact solution of the P of X or whatever. They don't do that. They say, I'm going to have a model that is just going to model P of X. I don't care how it does it and what constraints they are. Um, and the loss is just going to come from somewhere else, right? I am aware that I cannot just do log likelihood. I'm just going to get a more interesting loss. Um, and they do it by phrasing it like a game. They say, OK, given that I once again sample from a Gaussian, I'm going to give this sample to a model, so usually a neural network, uh, that I'm going to call the generator. And this generator takes in the noise and produces an image to the best of their abilities. Um, training this would be relatively hard, as we mentioned earlier, because of the curse of dimensionality. So how can we guide the training? And their suggestion was, OK, I'm going to add a second network, uh, D, that I'm going to call the discriminator. And this function, uh, this uh, discriminator, is going to take in images. And it's going to tell me whether they come from the data set or, the, or whether they were generated. Um, this generator, by the way, is going to get images from both as well. It's going to see both the data set and whatever this guy produces. So if this guy produces completely garbage images, the discriminator is having a, going to have a great time, very easy. If this guy's really good, this guy should be able to struggle, right? So it's a careful balance, which is part of the problem with GANs. Um, in more mathsy terms, these two have, as you might imagine, conflicting ob objectives. The generator wants to fool the discriminator. The discriminator wants to be able to tell apart whether it is data or whether it was generated. Um, so you can write their objective for the, actually, let me use pointer. For the discriminator, it wants to be able to maximize the correctly classified data points. So if it's a data, it wants to say that it's from the data. And it wants to, this is the equivalent of minimizing, but it was basically the, wants to maximize the expectation of one minus whatever the guy generated. So if it's generated by the guy, low probability. If it's generated from the data, high probability, if that makes sense. That's what that is saying. Um, and then the generator is basically just this last part, right? It wants to do the opposite. It wants to minimize this last part that the guy wants to maximize. So they have opposing objectives. The reason that this guy has this extra term is because you have to somehow embed it in the data as well. Um, and what this creates actually is a game. It's a minimax game. And that's why I think it's quite interesting because so far we were really only dealing with like objectives and it's all very generative modeling. But if you've ever done game theory, then all of a sudden this pops up and you're like, great, this is exciting. Um, a minimax game uh, basically is in game theory when you assume, OK, how can I minimize my loss if I assume the worst, so the max, right? If everything goes really badly, how can I minimize the loss? Um, for two-player zero-sum games, um, it, it has certain, pro uh, certain characteristics. This is a two-player sum, zero-sum game, because we have the generator and the discriminator and zero sum because they have the opposing objectives. Um, and for this particular case, the best solution is known as the Nash equilibrium. Um, and it's the best you can possibly do under these circumstances. Um, so yeah, this objective of the GAN is actually minimax uh, game between those two. And uh, you're trying to see how can, uh, how can we train them jointly. Um, and that's the, that's the objective. What's interesting about this, and this is what actually fascinates me about multi-agent, and this is something I've worked at DeepMind as well, is that the moment you start having two players, things get really complicated and weird, right? If you have an objective that only depends on something fixed, you can, you, values mean something, you know? You can just keep training for that and you'll get better and better. If you have things that are a function of each other, that where the, the value function depends on other people that are also optimizing, things are relative. Things get weird. You can get stuck in loops, and all of a sudden, um, uh, yeah, you can get stuck in cycles. It doesn't, uh, optimization, optimizing and getting better doesn't actually mean that you are getting better. You might be uh, getting stuck in some uh, trivial loop. Um, when you train, you can see this here, for example, where sometimes if the generator is complete shit, you obviously the discriminator doesn't have to be particularly good either, right? They'll be like, I'm doing a great job, but actually it's because the generator is really bad. And the other way around, right? So you depend on other people for your objective function, which is really cool from an academic perspective, but it's also a real nightmare when you're trying to train, right? And I think that this is part of the problems that uh, GANs had when training. Nonetheless, NVIDIA, of course, managed to get high resolution samples of faces, even with, uh, with GANs. Uh, which actually looked very good. And for a long time, GANs were the way to generate images, the go-to way. 
um, and had like, yeah, we're the most reliable ones. Nowadays, as I mentioned, again, people have gone more towards the fusion models, um, but it's an interesting uh, concept none the way. Part of the reason they've gone to the fusion models is because, as I mentioned, they're quite hard to train. Um, and they also suffered from this thing called mode collapse, where essentially you would, well, initially the, the generator would generate complete randomness, then it could kind of okay. And then over training, it would just collapse and only do the same, the same, the same. <clears throat> and if you think about it, it makes sense, right? It, it can make sense because the generator, as long as it generates really good ones or this one image of a one really well, it's done, right? It's done its objective. It can fool the generator and then it'll be happy. So you can argue that there's some problems there with the definition of some things. But uh, there were a lot of papers trying to overcome some of the initial flaws of GANs and how to address some of these problems. But I think ultimately, Diffusion has probably, as of today, won the battle and has uh, um, put GAN a little bit more in the backseat of things. Great. So GANs, great because you can parallel sample things. Not so great, and that's what makes them stand out. We cannot evaluate the log likelihood because we're not really in log likelihood space. We're just having, we're playing a little game and we're just generating images. We, it's not really embedded in reality. It also makes it hard to compare different GAN models or different models trained by different peoples, right? We don't have one unifying metric and it's rather just, it depends on how good your discriminator is. It's always, as I mentioned, it's always a relative uh, metric. So also not super great in that sense. Um, and then on top of that, unstable training, as I mentioned, mode collapse. So there are a few issues here and there. Great, because I'm Spanish, I speak very fast and will be done early. <laughs> um, but a quick summary. Um, I've walked you through some of the main players in generative models in the last decade, I'd say, that have been relevant. As we have discussed, some are more relevant than others today. Everything is right now as a diffusion model and a transformer, and, or both. Um, but still, I think it's interesting to understand how people how people have gotten to the different models and what the assumptions are and why it is actually so difficult, right? Um, there's, as we mentioned, there's not one best model. So depending on what your application is, some assumptions might be better fitting than some others. Language is very differently structured from images, let alone all the other millions of problems that are in the world that are getting maybe less attention at the moment. Um, also, if I think back of my uni generative model classes, Actually, if anyone, had, if anyone was in uni 10 years ago, um, if you had any of those classes, you would usually start with GMMs, uh, Gaussian mixture models. That was the classic, here's the, here's the generative model example. Um, and you would derivate, uh, derive all of it uh, manually. This is a simple model that I didn't want to cover here, but I wanted to mention it just in case. There's also another class that I've not covered called energy-based models. Uh, so anyone who cares about Boltzmann machines and Hinton and the 2010s, can look that up as well. Um, also currently not incredibly in vogue, but you never know when they might come back. Also had uh, interesting thoughts as well. And with that, thank you and I'll take questions. Mm -hmm.